Okay, we're carrying on in our study of the letter of James, and I'll get to where we're, we are in a minute, but I always like to back up and remind you a little bit of where, what I have said before, at least how I understand the flow of thought in the letter, and I will, uh, I don't go back as far each week, but I like to go back a little bit so you can remember the context of, of what we're talking about. In chapter 1, verse 19, down through chapter 2, verse 13, James calls his readers, these, these poor Jewish Christians who are outside of Palestine, he calls them to be doers of the word and not simply hearers of the word. He's calling them to repentance, to, to put into practice God's will in their lives, and he sees ways that they're not doing that. So that's 119 to 213. Now subdividing that, in 119 to 227, he urges them to be doers of the word with regard to their anger toward their oppressors, and their evil speech toward the oppressors. And you can see how that would come about, but he doesn't excuse it. He calls them to be doers of the word in those particulars. Then in chapter 2, verse 1 to 13, he calls them to be doers of the word with regard to their favoring of the rich at the expense of the poor. And I talked about how that could have come about and, and what's going on there. See, by dishonoring the poor, they were violating the royal law. They were failing to love their neighbor as themselves. And he warns them that if they continue on that path of dishonoring the poor, that if they continue on that path of refusing to show them mercy, that they will not be shown mercy by God on the day of judgment. In other words, if they refuse and reject the ethics of faith, the call of faith, what it means to be a disciple of Christ, if they reject that, they will not be shown mercy by God. Then having called his readers to good works with regard to hostility toward their oppressors and with regard to their preference toward the rich, then in chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, so he's made that call, he's urged them, you need to be serious about this, you need to be doers of the word. Then having done that in chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, he defends that call, at least the way I understand it. He defends that call against a circulating false doctrine that he's heard about. That there's this circulating false doctrine that works are irrelevant or insignificant for those who are in Christ. So here he's been saying, listen, you need to do this, do this. The will of God, the will of God. And yet he knows that there are people out there who are hearing that, no, no, no. That works are insignificant or irrelevant. Now this no doubt was rooted in a misunderstanding of Paul's doctrine of, of justification by grace through faith undoubtedly was rooted in that. James says in chapter 2, verses 14 to 7, so he's going to defend his call to works in light of that circulating error out there. And he does it in 2, 14 to 17. He shows the error of that doctrine that's circulating, that twisting of Paul's doctrine, the idea that works are irrelevant to a Christian life. He defends his call to works in light of that first by showing the error of that doctrine from an everyday example. And what he tells him, he says, look, just as lip service to the poor is of no value, and that's something they would have understood. You know, they sit here and say, no, 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 that's cool. You just go and be warm and well-fed, and that's it. But doesn't do anything for them. Well, these poor people understood that that was worthless. So he's making an analogy, you see, from an everyday example. He says, just as you already understand that lip service to the poor is of no value, So faith without works is of no value. It is dead. So he first defends it, his call to works against this circulating false doctrine by an everyday example. He says, just as you understand lip service to the poor is of no value, that's the same idea. Faith without works is dead. Then in chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, he shows the error of that doctrine by the fate of demons. Look, He says, demons, they believe that there's one almighty God But because they're unwilling to act on that belief, it's inadequate to save them. They understand and believe that to be true. But because they will not surrender to that truth and live their lives according to that truth, they are left simply to shudder. Despite having that intellectual understanding, because they won't commit their will to it, they are left to shudder, and that's a reference to their fate of the eternal fire you see in Matthew 25, 41. So even though they know that intellectually, because they won't live according to it, what's their fate? Their faith is condemnation. 
So he's showing the error from the fate of demons. And then in 2.20 to 26, he shows the error from the doctrine of that doctrine. He shows it from Scripture. And that's where I want to pick back up. He says in 2.20 to 26, But are you willing to understand, O foolish man, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith worked with his good works... And that faith was made complete by works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, And Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different way? For as the body without the spirit is dead so also faith without works is dead. See, the faith that saves, as I've said numerous times, the faith that saves is a living faith. It is a faith that finds expression in obedience. That is inherent in faith. A dead faith is one that says, Lord, Lord, but refuses to act as though the confession's true. Just like in Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It is somebody who says, look, I make that confession, but I live like it's not true. Well, this is what he's talking about. You see, to speak of a faith that has no works is like at the end of the class last week. I said, to to say that, to speak of a faith that has no works is like speaking of a human life that has no heartbeat, no breathing. No brain waves. You see, works are the vital signs of faith. To have those things, to say I have biblical saving faith and have no works is, is impossible. You see, the two go together. Now, given that obedience inevitably accompanies a saving faith, a biblical faith, a genuine faith, one cannot remain justified before God without obedience. You cannot remain justified while being in rebellion to God. You can't do that. Now, the refusal to obey is conclusive proof that there's no saving faith, that there's only lip service. If I say, Jesus is Lord, and the Lord says, I want you to do this, and I say, drop dead. Well, what is that? Then then when I say, Jesus is Lord, it's lip service. You see, I don't really mean he's Lord, because to say he's Lord is to say, well, he's Lord. (laughs) Right? If, If he's Lord, he's Lord. And if the Lord calls me to do something and I say, forget it, well, then you're not living consistently with that profession, and that profession is mere lip service. James stresses the obedience side of the equation. Why is he doing that? So I say, you see, biblical faith inevitably carries with it a surrender and a doing, and it has fruit that flows from that faith. There are signs, there are vital signs from it. Now, James is stressing that side of the equation, the obedience side of the equation, because he's addressing Christians who had divorced their faith from their lives, and they were hearing that one could be saved through a non-working faith, a faith that was a mere intellectual assent. So, you know, he's calling them. They're living in a way that is not right. They're being angry toward their oppressors. They're using evil speech toward them. They're dishonoring the poor. They're trying to rationalize that and justify. He calls them to be doers of the word with regard to those things. So he's stressing the obedient side because he's he's addressing Christians who have divorced their faith from their life and who are being told that's perfectly fine, that's right, that's the doctrine of God is that faith works have no relevance. All you have to do is think these things are true, then live any way you want. So that's why he's stressing the obedience side of the equation. It's because of the audience and the situation uh, he's addressing. Now these Jewish believers, you see, they accepted that Abraham's obedience in offering Isaac was indispensable to his continuing justification before God. He didn't have to argue that with them. You can see it's rhetorical. He says in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? He understands that they would all say, yeah, that's right. He doesn't have to argue the point. He assumes the point. Because they would understand that that was in fact the case. They accepted that Abraham's obedience to God's command in offering Isaac 
that that was indispensable to his continuing justification before God, if he had refused to obey, you see, if Abraham's faith had ceased to be a matter of both mind and will, he would no longer have been right with God. He would have then been a rebel. And so he under, they understand that. He doesn't have to make that, to argue the case for him. James says a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. And he cites Abraham in Genesis 22 as an example. Paul says in Romans 3 and 4, a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. And he cites Abraham in Genesis 15 as an example. And this is a long thing. Well, how are these positions to be understood? What Paul says and what James says. How are these things to be understood? And I think that the way they're to be understood, at least a crucial aspect of understanding it, is to recognize that works are not the basis on which God's grace is bestowed. That's absolutely certain. Works, performance, deeds, obedience, they are not, that is not the basis on which God's grace is bestowed. Rather, works and those things are the byproduct of the faith on which grace is bestowed. They are the byproduct. They are the wake of biblical faith. They are not the basis on which God's grace is bestowed. Since biblical faith, you see, true saving faith, true surrender to God, not simply intellectual assent, but a surrender of the will. Okay, since true biblical faith necessarily works, if that, if that equation is right, the two ends of the stick, right? That if you have true biblical faith, it inevitably produces some indication and some sign of that surrender and commitment. And so given that fact, if you, given that, that that's how things are, the absence of works indicates what? It indicates the absence of a saving faith. If I simply say, look, I don't care what you want. Yes, 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 I know you want me to live a certain way. Yes, I say you're the Lord and I understand who you are, but I'm not going to do that. What well, do you see? That that is simply intellectual assent. That's not biblical saving faith. So works are relevant to judgment. They're relevant to judgment. One is, quote, justified by them only in a secondary or derivative sense. You see, they are the byproduct, the wake of saving faith. So I can look at the works... And I can say that the person who has works there, that's a reflection here. True faith will work. No works, no biblical faith. So I can look at either end of the stick, and that's what's going on. And that's how I understand those verses that speak of one's works as a basis of judgment. They puzzle us sometimes. For instance, in Matthew chapter 25, 31 to 36, a couple of texts I put up last week, John 5, 28 and 29. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 text in Galatians, where it looks like he says, look, he's going to be looking at the works. You say, how can he do that? I thought we're saved by grace through faith, not by work. You're not saved by works. But works accompany the faith by which you're saved. They are a byproduct of it. And I said before, can you imagine somebody who has any kind of commitment and surrender? I I could have brought in, I've read before, uh, Jimmy Allen's book, Persuading Men to Receive Jesus. He has in there a little a note of something that was read on the floor of the House, United States House of Representatives by a communist. And you ought to hear this guy talking. I wish I had brought it. Where he sits here and says, listen, uh, this cause is my life, my food. I live it. I breathe it. I judge everything in accordance with it. Well, do you think somebody who's made that kind of surrender to the communist cause that that surrender would show itself in their life? Or do you think he would look the same way as he did before he had made that? Well, to me, to ask the questions, to answer it. You can't have a true surrender to something and not have it be reflected in your life. And that's the point. I think that's what James is talking about. Now, the faith of which Paul spoke, Paul wasn't talking about a dead faith, a sterile, inactive faith, a simple intellectual understanding of certain facts that didn't, didn't... Uh, affect how a person lived Paul that's not faith for Paul at all he would never have considered that I mean Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything rather what matters is faith working through love that's what matters is faith 
working. Paul would never countenance the idea. No, no, no. Faith is simply thinking these things and then living like you don't believe these things. That, that would be, Paul would say, that's not faith at all. That's not what I mean by faith. And that's what many people in our world think is faith. And it's simply not biblical. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, he says, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is everything. And I met you last week. He said, well, wait a minute, Paul. Circumcision was a commandment. Paul, you show he's showing there are classes of commandments. I'm not talking about those kinds of things, those kinds of temporary things that were just these amoral civil distinctions between Jews and Gentiles, okay? I'm talking about the eternal moral desires of God that were also embedded in the Mosaic Law and that continue in the law of Christ, which is centered in love. And I talked about that last week. But you see here, I just want you to see that Paul would never countenance the idea that the faith I'm talking about is simply this intellectual ascent. Now, the issue that Paul faced, yes, Okay, now if you heard her, same idea I'm driving at. She said she's always looked at it like obedience, deeds. It's a testimony of your faith. Okay, you see, that's why I think it's important to see. It's a byproduct. It's an accompaniment. But you always have to be careful and understand that it is not the obedience that gains you anything. Because that's the road to self-righteousness and spiritual neuroses. Okay, so you have to understand that. But James is dealing with another idea. See, James is dealing with the idea that faith is simply intellectual assent. And he says, that's crazy on the other side. You see, you can't, that, that can't be right. And I'm just pointing out, when you see that Paul talks about one thing, James talks about another, and they're often pitted against one another. And I want you first to see that Paul's concept of faith would never have endorsed the error that James is, is addressing. He would have never said, no, 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 uh, Faith without works is wonderful. It's perfectly fine. It's biblical. It's acceptable. He wouldn't say that. And I'm reading you these texts to show you. He says, no, keeping the commands of God is everything. It's everything. Now, does Paul not know that salvation is by grace? Through faith? Not by, of course he does. He said it. So he understands that very well. So you see, but he realizes the faith that saves is a faith that inevitably changes a person and produces by the power of the Spirit, a different life. And so this is an important thing. Now, what Paul's facing, the issue that occupied Paul a lot, was whether Gentiles were obligated to obey the set of commands that comprised the Mosaic Law. Okay, the, the unit of commands that comprised the Mosaic Law. That body or package of commands that included those distinctive elements like circumcision, sacrifices, the priesthood, holy days, ritual purity laws, food laws. It included a lot of things. So the, his question is, must Gentiles come under that set of laws that are part of the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law? Must they come under those things? And part of Paul's answer, why they were not. He says, no, Gentiles are not obligated to come under that set of commandments. Part of his answer for why they were not is that, is that sta one standing before God is not based on one's works. You see, it is a gift bestowed by God. And you see that Romans 3, 28 and chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. So to the extent that Jews were arguing, listen, the Gentiles must come under this set of commands known as the Mosaic Law because obedience to those commands is the basis of one's standing before God. That's what achieves your standing. That's what earns it. So if they don't come under and do it, they can't be saved. To the extent they were making that argument, Paul says that they're simply wrong. They're simply wrong. And see, the fact that Abraham's justification preceded his works. You remember that point that Paul makes in Romans. The fact Abraham's justification preceded his works shows that his works were not the basis of his right standing before God because he was right before he worked. So he makes that point. So to the extent they were arguing that, listen, Gentiles must come under this set of commands called the Mosaic Law because that is the basis of one standing before God, Paul says that's not right. 
That's not the basis of one standing. One standing before God is based on one's faith. Abraham was justified by faith before he worked. Okay, so that he first deals with that idea. Now, Paul also made clear that the Christ event had rendered the old covenant obsolete and thus had rendered the body of laws, the package of commands that were part of that covenant, that were an integral part of that covenant. We have this pact and part of that pact is this unit and this body of laws. Paul says the Christ event rendered the old covenant obsolete and thus rendered the body of laws that were part of that covenant also obsolete. Okay, now the thing that I stress a lot, this does not mean, this does not mean that there are no ethical obligations for Christians, that there are no moral requirements for Christians. We are not antinomians. We are not against law, commands, dues. You can't be. They're everywhere. You see, it doesn't mean that, that we're outside of ethical obligations. That's not the case at all. You see, it, it, what, what it is is that we are under the, the, law, the law of love, the royal law, the law of Christ, see? It doesn't mean there are no ethical obligations for Christians. It means that the obligations of the new covenant are not the same as the obligations of the old covenant. Now, are there some that carry through? Of course, they're all. Paul cites them. He tells parents or children, obey your parents. Right out of the Ten Commandments. He tells them in Ephesians. We say, Paul can't do that because none of these can apply. No, it is the set that can apply. You see? So many of those things that are the ongoing moral principles that existed before the Mosaic Covenant were embedded in the Mosaic Covenant and continue after the Mosaic Covenant. They carry on. You see? And so Paul can appeal to these things and not only uh, children obeying your parents, but he has a number of other things. Okay, so, so to the extent that the Jews argued, look, Gentiles have to follow the commands of the Mosaic law that were peculiarly covenantal. Yes, 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 they have to obey these ongoing moral things, but they have to obey all of it. They have to obey the sacrifices. They have to obey the food laws. They have to obey the ritual purity laws because those things are manifestations of faith. You see, if you have faith, there will be an inevitable byproduct of that will be you will be circumcised. And Paul says nonsense because why? Because the Christ event rendered the old covenant obsolete. We are not under that covenant. We are under a new covenant that has a new set of ethical obligations that are indeed rooted in the old covenant, in the Mosaic law. And that's why Paul can appeal to them and say, uh, don't do this, don't do that. All of these things, lying. Right? I mean, all of these things, they carry through. But what are these things, these amoral, civil distinctions? The sacrifices, the things that Paul says in Ephesians, this was a barrier and a dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. I can't eat with you. I have all these food laws. Why? To separate Israel from the Gentiles. You see, so those things, he says, no, they would be wrong if they're making that argument. So whether they are claiming that you have to obey these things because that achieves your standing before God, that's wrong. And whether they're saying that you have to obey those elements that are peculiarly covenantal, sacrifice of circumcision, because that would be an outflow of saving faith, they also are wrong because the old covenant has been rendered obsolete by the Christ event. Okay? So Paul deals with that question. He deals with that issue. Now the issue that James faced was whether mere mental assent to truths of, of Christ are sufficient for salvation. That's his point. See, he's facing, he's dealing with a different thing. Now, the fact Abraham's justification would not have continued without work, something they accept, that he doesn't have to argue. The fact Abraham's justification would not have continued without works, it shows that saving faith is more than mental assent. That's his point. You see, so to the extent his people are thinking, no, 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 we can divorce faith from life, and that's Christian doctrine. Because works are irrelevant, the only thing that matters is do I intellectually believe A, B, and C? And he says, no, that's not right. 
That's not right because that's not what faith means. He declared that wasn't right and Paul would have agreed with him. That's what I want you to see. Paul would have agreed with him. Daniel Wallace says in his book, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, both James and Paul would agree, I believe, with the statement, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. I think that's right. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. Here's what the Douglas Moo said in his commentary. Christians need to continue to pay attention to the warning of James that true faith is to be tested by its works and that only a faith that issues in works is genuinely saving faith. That's obvious to me. That's what James is saying. He says, James recognizes that Christians continue to sin. Chapter 3, verse 2, so he clearly does not expect 100% conformity to the will of God. That will not happen until that day. You understand? You and I live between the ages, and you and I will struggle with, with sin. We're going to struggle with consecration. We're going to struggle with allowing the Spirit of God to transform us into Christ's heart, life, behavior. We will struggle with that until that day, and at that day... We will be like him. You see? So this idea, you see, he says that James recognizes that Christians continue to sin, so he clearly does not expect 100% conformity to the will of God. But how high must the percentage be? Now, this is what troubles us. How many works are necessary to validate true saving faith? James, of course, gives no answer. But what we can say with confidence on the basis of James's teaching is that the claim of anyone who is totally unconcerned to lead a life of obedience to God to have saving faith must be questioned. And I'd go beyond that. I'd say it's crazy. You see, so you have, James doesn't map out and say, well, what is, the, what is the, the quantum? You see, what is the quantum? His point is for somebody who's claiming that these two things are divorced, that I can claim saving faith when I only have intellectual assent and don't care what God wants. Now, all of us, in our submission to Christ, we all limp along at different rates, different degrees. But do you see the difference in that and somebody who says, I think this like the demons, but I'm going to live just like that's not true. You see, there's a difference there. Now, we would like him to spell out and say, here is the minimum quantity of deeds and works that will manifest or be a re reflection of saving faith. I'm sure that would vary with people, how badly they've been bent, pushed, damaged by sin and all that. So I don't think you can do that. But what you can say is that faith, works flow out of saving faith inevitably and the person who's unconcerned about that does not have saving faith. And that's what James is talking about. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I've read you this quote before. He was a a brilliant young German pastor. He was a Lutheran. He was a seminary teacher who opposed Hitler and his policies. And he was executed by the Nazis shortly before the Allies swept in to liberate Germany. And in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, here's what Bonhoeffer says. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ in which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. You see, this is the thing about Christianity. And part of what I think uh, irks the world about Christianity is we have so many people who sit here and say, listen, no, 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 I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, and then live exactly like the world. And people look at it and they say, what are you talking about? There's nothing radical here. There's no power here. I don't want to be that way. What drew people in the, in, to the early church was this radical transformation that they saw that accompanied this message. He said, listen, Jesus is the Savior. Jesus has come. The new age has dawned and we are participating in it. And that is why we treat one another the way we do. That is why we are family members. We are family members even though we're not blood. Well, what are you doing for it? Well, we're burying the widows and those people who can't afford to be buried. Who's going to take care of that? They just normally just be cast out. Well, we are. Why? Because they're our family. 
You see, now what do we lose? See, when we don't have that, you lose a tremendous sense of the reality of what is Christianity. And that's what I think. I just think it irks a lot of people. And, of course, a lot of people use excuses for different things. Now, he says here, he, he, at the end there, he talks about Rahab in Joshua chapter 2. Rahab's faith was expressed in her welcoming and protecting Israel's spies. She didn't say, look, I believe in God and then refuse to honor God's agents. She didn't say that. She didn't say, yeah, that's right. We know, we know that you're coming and all this and God has given the land to you and all that. And then refuse to honor them. She didn't do that at all. Her walk matched her talk, and that's why he puts her in there. You see, it's another example from Scripture of somebody who's doing out of a belief. And that's how we're to be, doing out of belief. These things flow together. Then James says in chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in speech, he's a complete man, able to bridle the entire body as well. Now this existence of this error that James has been made aware of. So he knows the people, apparently, you know, I'm reading between the lines here, detective work, but I think this is on track. He apparently has, is aware that these Jewish Christians outside of Palestine who are being oppressed that these Christians are being influenced and are hearing this circulating distortion of Paul's teaching. He may not know that its source, but he's apparently aware of that. And the existence of that, of that error, that mere mental assent to the truths of Christ is sufficient for salvation, that prompts James then to issue a caution about teachers. You see, to me, it flows right out of what he's saying. So it flows right out of that. He has, been, he has been defending his call to be doers of good works, doers of the word, against this circulating false doctrine. So he's saying, well, how can you call us to that one? What we're hearing is this. And he says, what you're hearing is wrong. That's how I can do it. What you're hearing is wrong. And he shows them that in a number of ways. And then he turns to this question of teachers. And he tells them, listen, that uh, not many of them should become teachers, and the reason he gives is that teachers will receive a stricter or greater judgment. Now, Douglas Moose says in his commentary, he says, Teachers, because they bear so much responsibility for the spiritual welfare of those to whom they minister, will be scrutinized by the Lord more carefully than others. Jesus warned, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. God has given to teachers a great gift and entrusted them uh, to them the deposit of the faith. He will expect a careful account of the stewardship. Paul reflects just this sense of responsibility as he addresses the elders of the church at Ephesus. He stressed that he had been faithful to his task as a herald of the gospel. I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I've not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. And this is what J James is telling them, listen... That you have to, uh, you shouldn't jump into this. You have to be careful about this. And the reason is, is that teachers are going to face a stricter or a greater judgment. And the reason this stricter judgment should cause some of them to think twice about becoming teachers is that of all the ways that, hum of, that humans stumble. Well, why, why should this idea of a stricter judgment give some pause and give you second thought about becoming a teacher? Well, because of all the ways that, that people stumble, human beings stumble, sinning in speech is among the easiest. See, sinning in speech is among the easiest ways for people to sin. The potential for sinning in speech is so great that if one could keep the tongue in check so as not to sin with the tongue, then one could bring everything under control. If, if, if a person could do that, if a per this tongue is so wild, that if a person could bring that completely under control, well, then he could bring everything under control. It's that, it's it, that easy to sin with, with the tongue. And in that case, see, you would have arrived. You'd be complete. You'd be perfect. You'd be fully mature. So you see, you have this idea of a stricter judgment that's combined with the potential for stumbling that exists when you're running your mouth, which is what a teacher does. You see, so you have stricter judgment 
and this great potential for sinning when you're running your mouth, that means that careful consideration is required before becoming a teacher. You know, it's not just fall off a log and get in front of people and start talking. You're representing God when you do it. You know, and and I've said to people before, you don't like to be misrepresented. That's why it takes a lot of struggle and wrestling and praying and thinking and reading. You have to do it. You have to do it so when you've done it, you can stand before God and say, however wrong I was, you know I labored at it. You know I did the best I could at it. I gave all that I had to the task that you called me to do. See, that's, that's something that's important. You know, if people who teach classes just fall into it, uh, you have to listen. <laughs> you have to listen to this. Because when you do this, you're speaking on God's behalf, and it is really a, it's a serious responsibility, and, a, and a, of course, a great thing. Now, okay, so he says, look, you know, now in saying that not many of them should become, should become teachers... James is referring to their present state of immaturity. James knows these people to whom he's writing, and he's referring to their present state of immaturity. Not many of them were ready to be teachers. So he's saying, listen, you have to think carefully about that. Why? Because he's already hearing out there, somebody's selling this stuff. Somebody's selling the idea that how a person lives has nothing to do with Christian life or Christian faith. None of those things are divorced. All you got to do is think this. And so he hears that out there. So he's telling them, listen, you know, you you guys aren't spiritually ready. Not many of them were ready to be teachers. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, there the writer, he rebukes the immature for not progressing in faith so as to be able to teach. So they're coming at the situation or the question from two different directions. James says, in essence, look, you're too immature to be teaching. And the writer of Hebrews says, you shouldn't be so immature. You see, so they come at it in two different ways. But you have to be mature. You have to have some comprehension, okay, of, of, of the revelation of God if you're going to teach people. And that's one of the things. I, I think some of what's happened, not just churches of Christ, I think some of, the, some of what happens in the religious world is that this is the, one of the only areas that we think nobody can teach us anything. We sit in classes and don't listen because we think, I know as much as anybody who's teaching. I've been around the Bible a long time. Who can teach me anything? Now, I don't know of any other field where we do that. Any other field we sit here and say, well, you know, hey, what do I don't have to listen? I've, I've read the Bible. I've studied the Bible, this kind of thing. No one can teach me. So there is this tremendous resistance to being taught because we think there's nothing new under the sun. I know everything. Now, maybe that shoe doesn't fit, but I smell it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've seen uh, this idea. And as I say, we don't do that anywhere else. Other than we think, no, that somebody, you know, that, that, yeah, they, they, I can listen and learn something. And that's just, I, I think that's an important thing. Okay, now, here he says in 3, 3 through, uh, verse 3 through the first part of verse 5. Now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they will be responsive to us, we also guide their entire body. Also look at the ships. Though being so large and driven by strong winds... They are guided by a very small rudder where the impulse of the pilot wills. In the same way, the tongue is a small member, yet boasts great things. So James here, he says, look, caution is needed in becoming a teacher. Not only because the teacher faces a stricter judgment and a significant risk of stumbling because controlling the tongue is a difficult thing. So not only there's caution needs to be exercised in becoming a teacher, not only because of that, but also because teaching has a tremendous influence on the direction of the church, the local body of Christ. That's what this stuff is about. You know, you can take this little bit, and what does it do to the big horse? You got this little rudder, and what does it do to this huge ship? It directs it. And he's telling these teachers you need to be careful because it is a tremendously influential thing for the spiritual course of the body of Christ. And that's why people say, I don't care about, you know, the doctrine or anything. What are you talking about? You know, exhibit A here, James is the claim James was hearing that was circulating that works are of no significance in a Christian's life. 
This is a perfect example, right? If that were taught to Christians as the truth of God, the effect on the congregation would be catastrophic. If somebody gets up here and says, no, no, look, that's nothing. You have to worry about that. Don't think about that. Don't think about that. I just want you to believe A, B, and C, and that's it, and then you just go live any way you want. God's very happy with that. Well, what do you think the consequences would be on the spiritual course of the community? They're saying, that's God. That's the message of God. That's the word of God. It would be catastrophic. It would be absolutely catastrophic. Christians would become casual about sin. They would say, God doesn't care about this. And actually, I'm kind of pulled to it, and I think it's a good thing. You know, I think, you know, snorting this, or, you know, sleeping with this, or you pick it. I think that's a good thing. And God doesn't care. Well, what would the, the, the result then is going to be condemnation. And so do you see that it's very, very important. So there's caution is required in becoming a teacher. Not only because there's a stricter judgment and a high potential for error because of the difficulty in controlling the tongue. But also because there's tremendous influence as a teacher as you stand before people and say, Thus saith the Lord in so many words. You stand and say, this is the will of God. This is what God, this is what James, the Spirit of God, through James is saying to his people. And you need to hear the word, church. You see, when somebody's doing that, it has tremendous potential for influencing the community and setting the spiritual course. So I think that, that that's what he's talking about. And then he goes to, the bell's going to ring here in a second. Maybe I can just read this. He says in the second part of, of verse 5 of chapter 3 down through verse 12. See how a fire of small size ignites a forest of great size. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness placed among our members. It stains the entire body and sets on fire the course of life and is set on fire by hell. 